Crikey Moses, Kamal, brace yourself because we have got an exclusive poll for The Telegraph published tonight, basically predicting Tory Geddon, almost complete wipeout for the Conservatives and the biggest ever majority for a governing party in history for Labour. And after that D-Day debacle, the soaking wet suit, more terrible news for Rishi Sunak, our Savanta poll suggests that he could become the first serving prime minister to lose his seat. We will, of course, be crunching all of the numbers with the man who ran the poll, Chris Hopkins of Savanta. And a little later in the pod, we're going to be speaking to former Justice Secretary Robert Buckland about his suggestion that there should be an amnesty for all those people who received Covid fines. Even Boris Johnson? Wait and see. Welcome to The Daily Tea with me, Camilla Tomini. And me, Kamala. Kamal, the newsroom has been working overtime today, hasn't it? There's been much excitement because we've commissioned this exclusive poll with Savanta. And I don't think we were expecting these results. Uh, they're pretty punchy. So if we look at vote share, that would be the Labour Party on 44 percent, the Conservatives on 23 percent, Reform on 13 percent, the Lib Dems just one point percentage point behind on 12. That would give over 500 uh, seats to Labour and would be an absolute disaster for the Conservatives. Chris Hopkins, our man at Savannah, who carried out the polling, joins us now. Welcome to The Daily Tea, Chris. Um, sorry for saying this, but this does look quite punchy. I'm just saying, are you sure this is right? Because you've got rival pollsters giving different seat predictions. Ipsos have put the Tories on 115, Servation on 72, YouGov have just come out with a new poll and they're predicting the Tories might win 140 seats and yet you've got them down to 53. Yeah, look, I think I think ultimately we have to acknowledge at this point that the MRP modelling and seat predictions are are pretty tricky. Um, but obviously, so far in in in, in polling, at least in twenty nineteen and twenty seventeen, they were reasonably accurate. Um, I think obviously there is a big seat disparity among the pollsters at the moment. There is also, also still plenty of time in the campaign to go to maybe change things. But I think what's really important to to, to note about this is that. You, know, the, you mentioned the Epsos numbers there. That was based off an 18-point Labour lead that was, you know, essentially underwriting their seat modelling. You know, ours is a 22-point lead, and therefore there is going to be a difference mm. if you plugged um, our numbers into Ipsos's model. I'm sure they'd probably end up with a very similar seat count to ours. And likewise, if you put Ipsos's numbers into our seat model, you'll probably end up with something very similar to theirs. So, you know, there is the underlying polling data there is still a slight difference and there is still a slight difference again across the industry but we are talking frankly just four percentage points it's pretty close um but that could be the difference between i guess at this stage you know ipsos's numbers of 115 conservative mps is maybe not as bad or i mean it obviously isn't as bad as what as what we're saying but you know in the grand scheme of things i think it would still be considered a horrendous result for a governing party so you know yes there is there, there is difference between the seat numbers here i think we have to acknowledge that but you know, I don't think that really what's what, what's kind of underwriting how how any pollster gets to those numbers is particularly wrong, frankly. Just explain that to us, Chris, because people won't necessarily understand MRP polling and the methodology behind it. Yeah, so MRP is a relatively new technique, and I think it is also just, just worth saying at this point that it hasn't really been tested at an election where we are expecting such a giant swing away from one party to another, as we are expecting here based on just standard polling. Um, but essentially, it takes a large national sample, a much larger national sample than most opinion polls uh, conduct, and it essentially asks a voting intention question to you know, to, you know to, to different sorts of people and essentially what it does is it takes the probability that a you know or a, let's say a woman who's age 27 um without a degree living in a conservative liberal democrat marginal who voted leave or who voted conservative in 2019 um that lives in a certain sort of like neighborhood and basically extrapolates what 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 she has said in our single poll to what those equivalent people will be saying up and down the country um so yeah i mean i guess it is quite mathsy and, and quite heavy but essentially mm. it's trying to trying to model behavior 
based on what we get in our survey, knowing that there are certain proportions of that sort of person all across the country that are probably going to behave in a very similar way. I know Kamal wants to delve a little deeper into the methodology in just a minute as the resident mathematician of this pairing. However, just on this Rishi Sunak suggestion that he might lose his seat of Richmond in North Yorkshire, I mean, I was in a leaders meeting today. That's where the editor and all of the people involved in the comments section of the paper and indeed Phil Johnson, our chief leader writer, sit and decide what we're going to write for the next morning's paper. And Phil said... I will bet everyone in this room money that Rishi Sunak does not lose his seat. I mean, it would be unprecedented for a prime minister, a sitting prime minister, to not win his own constituency at general election. Yeah, absolutely. Look, and we, and we completely acknowledge that. I think that what the model tends to do, and again, we have to acknowledge that we are on the low side of conservative seat count here, but, but because of the swing in our polling away from the Conservative Party, to the Labour Party and also because of the added threat of Reform UK, essentially it's just, you know, essentially spitting out that a 19 and a half thousand majority or whatever Rishi Sunak is currently sitting on might not be enough. Now, MRP does, um, it does struggle to 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 include or, um, or, or, or to think about local factors. And I think, you know, Rishi Sunak won't be the only high profile name to be disadvantaged by MRP. I think we'll come up, come on to Nigel Farage being one and indeed Jeremy Corbyn in Islington North would be another one. Um, and obviously it doesn't include things like campaign effect or, or anything that's happening within the constituency. Name recognition isn't really a factor either. So right. yes, we do believe it would be incredibly unprecedented for Rishi Sunak to lose his seat. But I think more at the macro level, what our model is saying is that you know, Conservative MPs that are defending Rishi Sunak sized majorities are in deep trouble here. And I think we've actually seen that in in by elections and and, and and even in the locals that, yeah, you know, that the swing away from the Conservatives is such that there isn't really such thing as a safe Conservative seat anymore. I mean, it's not Kamal, isn't it? We've had a look at we've got Ben Butcher, our data guy who comes on the Daily Tea to kind of pair all of the numbers down and tell us which big beast might be left and which will fall. There's 15 cabinet ministers there that all lose their seats. And the only key leadership contender left, Kamal, is Cammy Badenoch. Yeah, there's very few prominent Conservatives left under this model. Chris, I absolutely take your point around this is a kind of direction of travel as much as it is the specific seats. I just want to start off with Labour. Um, the polls, your your vote share puts them on 44%, which is which is less than 1% above where they actually were in 1997, when obviously Tony Blair you know, did wing big, but nothing like this type of um, victory. What is it in first past the post and ref with reform as well playing a part in this election, which has meant such a huge effect on the majority for Labour? First past the post is, is your friend until it isn't. I think that that's basically where the Conservatives are at. You know, it, it, it has the real potential at the moment to, to really beat them up at this election. And I think that's absolutely what's contributing to some of the numbers that we've got. I think that, you know, as I say, the swing from Conservatives to, 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 Labour Party, to the Labour Party is huge and unprecedented. But obviously, the Reform UK are creating a huge headache and have created a, hu a huge spanner in the works for the Conservative Party just in this campaign. You know, we've got them, I think, on 14 percent or 13 percent in, in, in this poll, not taking a single seat. But that mm. ultimately means that on average across every constituency, they're going to take 13 percentage points. We know from our polling that Reform UK voters are far more likely, in fact, you know, almost eight times more likely, I think, to come from the Conservative 2019 than, than any other party. Therefore, you know, they are going to be taking votes away from, away from the Conservative Party. And that brings the threshold uh, in, an, in a given constituency under first past the post down for the Labour Party or the Liberal Democrats to win it. I think that's really what we're kind of saying here. You know, yes, a lot of these seats are going to be on a knife edge. And there is, uh, you know, we, we've got upper bounds and lower bounds that are quite wild, frankly, in this in, in, in this MRP model. But you know, it wouldn't take much, frankly, for the Labour Party to win a lot of constituencies with a reasonable, reasonably modest um, vote share. Equally, I don't think it would take much if the Conservative Party could maybe reduce this to 19 percentage points to maybe win a whole host more seats and, and, and us and our model end up having them way closer to, to 100 and perhaps more in line 
with some of our competitors than we currently have. You know, I think that first past the post, as I say, is very much your friend until it isn't. But when it isn't, it really does have the ability to punish you quite severely uh, under our electoral system. Chris, what do you, why do you think Rishi Sunak has had such difficulty moving the polls? Obviously, we've had, as we said at the, in the intro, he's had some missteps during the campaign, but obviously other parts of the campaign have been pretty punchy, pretty well put together. Had the public already made up its mind largely before um, this election? So why such a big gap and why still such a big gap? And second, we're coming into the last two weeks of this campaign. Is there any way back in terms of the public listening to any of the messages coming from the parties? Yeah, I think I think to, to a large extent, the public had already made up their mind. I don't necessarily think they'd made it up their mind on Rishi Sunak as a person or even as a politician, but I think they've made up made their mind up on the Conservative Party. I think that's for two broad reasons. The first one being that they've been in power for 14 years. I think you know that is you know often the expiry date for most uh, governments in in, in, in post war Britain, um, and therefore the Conservatives. Conservatives were probably naturally coming to an end. But also, you know, they had eroded a lot of trust under uh, Liz Truss and Boris Johnson. And then Rishi Sunak made immigration and other issues the centrepiece of his campaign with his pledges, and he's failed to deliver on a lot of them. I think that there is some extent, Kamal, where you know, given the latest inflation figures, I think we must question whether Rishi Sunak was right to go early and whether he should have waited. And I think that is maybe mm. compounding um, his 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 potential defeat here. Um, and then I think in terms of, you know, what what room for manoeuvre they still have, I think we saw in the first half of the, of the campaign, the Conservatives absolutely go after their core vote and Reform UK switches. I think that Nigel Farage, as I say, threw a massive spanner in that in those works. And I think that they've struggled to bring those 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 voters back. I think what we're probably going to hear in the last uh, in the last throws of this campaign is, is, is the Conservatives trying to maybe salvage some of those that have already switched to Labour. I think a lot of them switched for economic reasons or maybe just down to trust and competence or lack thereof in the Conservative Party. Um, but I think they are going to go after after Labour on, on, on tax, on on, on, on spending, on can Labour be trusted with the economy, that I think has been historically really, really, really powerful and really useful for the Conservative Party. I think that voters just might find it a little bit rich this time coming from uh, for coming from a government that, that, that presided over trustonomics that many voters still blame for, for, for some of the economic malaise that they find themselves in. But I think, you know, going back to that sort of almost tried and tested uh, messaging about Labour and and their economic credibility may well be where we see the Conservatives go. Whether it's going to move anything at this stage, I think is unlikely. Um, but you know, as I say, I think we we have to acknowledge that it could just be one or two points difference between you know our total oblivion that we're seeing versus you know a very very bad result mm. that perhaps other seat models are predicting at the moment. Quick final question, Chris. There's a bit of a contradiction because. We're talking about people having already made up their minds, but we've also been talking on various past podcasts about the undecideds. So how do the don't knows factor into this poll, Chris? Because we do know, I mean, the Conservatives keep on saying there are still millions of people who haven't made up their minds. Yeah, so they... they <laughs> <laughs> like they don't split for the Conservative Party anymore. I think that they perhaps once did, but it doesn't really appear as though there are as many as the Conservative Party are banking on, nor that they are definitely guaranteed to go back to the Conservative Party uh, if and when they make up their minds. I think there is a, a sense just within, you know, within the political commentary, and that includes pollsters to some extent, not that we're making any methodological tweaks to, to this end, but I think there is just a sense that we look at these numbers, you know, our, our, our MRP model today, and just kind of can't believe it, partly because we just know that the Conservative Party historically have been such an electoral ruthless machine. Um, and we don't really comprehend how it can go so, so horribly wrong. But I think that politically and mathematically, so much has worked against the Conservative Party and therefore to be relying on undecideds now sort of, you know, salvaging something for you, I think, is is, is is pretty desperate, frankly. I think in this survey, as in most polling, you know, they end up just being kind of kind of removed and, and, and scraped out. That doesn't mean that they won't end up going somewhere eventually. But I think the idea that they are definitely going to go home, you know, I'm just not sure that that's necessarily the case. And I think that for, for Conservative 
2019 voters that aren't going to vote conservative you know i think staying at home or or switching is probably just as appealing if not more than voting conservative again at this point chris thanks so much for joining us and taking us through all these numbers as you say maybe not quite uh, the total or near total wipeout that these numbers suggest, but whatever the direction of travel, it's going to be bad for the Conservatives. Come on, when you look at the list of sort of, it's easier to say who has left yes. than who has been forced out. Because we, were the both, numbers of... we were both scribbling down this morning, going through the list of seats, because there's so much detail, which you can see a lot of on telegraph.co.uk. So please do go there and have a look through. Obviously, we'll go through some of those names. But Camilla, let's deal. We were just scribbling down names and we were just yeah. shouting at each other. Yeah. Goodness, goodness, goodness. I mean, but I give, us, saying, give us some of those names. Come well, on. I'm saying grey hairs have gone like IDS, Ian Duncan Smith and David Davis, who have both been uh, MPs for decades and appeared on this podcast. So so that whole sort of tranche of people who were Eurosceptic back in the 80s is gone. You've then got most of the cabinet gone. So as well as the Prime Minister, James Cleverley, Mel Stride, who's been on the broadcast round a lot, Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, Oliver Dowden, the Deputy Prime Minister, Victoria Atkins, the Health Secretary, Penny Mordaunt, Leadership Hopeful, uh, John Glenn, who's been in the Treasury for some time, Esther McVeigh, the Common Sense Minister, Defence Secretary Grant Shapps, uh, the Welsh Secretary David T.C. Davies, Victoria Prentice, uh, the Attorney General. Uh, all these people have gone. Yeah. So and the whole cabinet's wiped out. All you've got left, well, I mean, it's easier to say who you've got left. Kemi Badenoch, Michelle Donnellan, Laura Trott, Claire Cortino and Tom Tugenda, who coincidentally appears to have announced his candidacy for leadership yesterday. By saying what? Well, uh, he sort Claire? of indicated, yes, I, I am considering a run and has made... For post-election? Yeah, okay, post-election. Well, good he luck, drinks Mr. Earl Grey and I, I'm not well, sure get him on I, for a cup of tea. <laughs> I'm not the sure other, if I can uh, trust him. One other person I did, I did notice, we did mention him yesterday, Rupert Harrison is one of the few Conservatives who've, who've got a bit of history with the party, former uh, Chief of Staff to George Osborne. He also could... Um, uh, win his seat, which is uh, Bista. Mm. Um, but you're right, in terms of recognisable names, Claire Coutinho, Kemi Badenoch and Tom Tugendhat appear to be it. I think uh, Chris made a really good point, I thought a really useful point, that it may not be quite this bad, No, but, <laughs> but, it's going to but be all very the polling bad. is going to be very, very bad. I think there are some really, I think two things here which we should chat through. One is reform. And mm -hmm. I just imagine that reform are going to win some seats. I think that whatever the test is. I mean, how humiliating is it going to be mm. for Nigel Farage, having declared himself a candidate to be PM in 2029, I'm doing this for the next five years, not winning Clacton? Yeah. That is, I mean, that. so he's tried eight times and failed. How does he unite the right if he's not even in the House of Commons? I think if he loses, I think his the notion of a parliamentary political career would, well, I think should therefore finish for yeah. Nigel Farage. He he, he's not to, able, he he said, he, maybe straight he over to Mar-a-Lago. Mar -Lago, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, but I, I'm not, I'm still, yeah. I, I still think that reform have got a good chance in a number of seats and the, the biggest chance is for... Um, Nigel Farage. Sorry, just on that point that Chris raised, mm. he said they didn't account for recognisability. That was which interesting. Wasn't I think it? it's really yeah. interesting mm. because let's be honest, they've been conducting this polling over the course of the last fortnight, and in that time, Farage has gained huge momentum. That doesn't mean, by the way, that he's necessarily going to top out at anything over 20% of the vote share, but I think. He is ahead in Clacton right now. I think we need to acknowledge that. And that fame factor does play a part. It yes, might uh, even play a part for people like Penny Morden in Portsmouth after she starred in the coronation with the sword. Yes, and the same for Rishi Sunak. So I think, yes, the, the data tells us these numbers. There's a sort of political emotion, isn't there, which you also have to play in, which data sometimes finds very difficult to, to mine. Um, let's just think a bit about Labour. This majority for Labour, if they get five, over 500 seats, I think that raises some really important questions for how Labour govern. And I think it raises some really big issues for Keir Starmer, for Rachel Reeves and for the other leading um, cabinet members, as they would be if, if this polling is to be believed, um, how they govern. Such a huge majority on 
hardly any different vote share from Tony Blair. Yeah. And Keir that it's something has to change in Keir Starmer about his clarity on issues like tax, mm. on issues like public service reform. Yeah. If you heard um, uh, Keir Starmer yesterday being interviewed by Nick Ferrari on LBC and not able to articulate clearly when they say no more taxes on working people, what does that mean? Yeah. He has a duty to lay that out very clearly. He, he, he in a way shouldn't actually care so much about, yeah, but then the headlines might say this or that Mm. or the other. Just be clear with the voter, because if you are heading for a huge majority with no effective opposition, none, he has to, I think, think to himself about what kind of prime minister does he want to be. So the former Justice Secretary, Sir Robert Buckland, who, he's the man who oversaw the courts during the COVID pandemic. He's called for this amnesty for more than 29,000 people who uh, received criminal convictions for breaking the COVID rules. He said those that have been fined should have their slates wiped clean rather than risk their career prospects being hampered by convictions handed out at what's been described obviously as an exceptional time. Well we're delighted to welcome Sir Robert Buckland, former Justice Secretary, onto the Daily Tea. Lovely to see you Sir Robert, thanks for joining us and I know you're busy campaigning in Swindon so thanks for sparing the time. Look, explain how this would work because Predictably, perhaps, Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer has reacted to your suggestion today and said this is a bad idea because it might mean that you cancel the fines that were given to Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak during Partygate and then you're letting them off scot-free. Yeah, yeah. Keir is either uh, deliberately uh, manipulating what I've said or just doesn't understand what I've said. I I hope it's not the latter, uh, because uh, he, as a a lawyer as well, will know and will remember that at the time we introduced these restrictions and the penalties, we said that we didn't want them to form part of people's criminal records, like a previous conviction for a violent or sexual offence or a dishonesty offence. Because they were exceptional circumstances, we were doing something that had never been done in peacetime. We were, in fact, locking the country down. Uh, There had to be some in order to deal with breaches of those rules. But we chose the fixed penalty notice route deliberately because we didn't want to see these become cr- a criminal record. What has been happening is that there's some evidence that in thousands of cases it, it, they have entered the police records and are being used as a criminal record. And that seems to me to be wrong. Uh, it potentially stops people from getting jobs that they need. Uh, a, a lot of young people were fined during COVID and, and it wasn't the intention of the government at the time to see them stigmatised uh, for many years afterwards. What I'm asking for is actually for us to be true to what we said at the time, which is that these um, um, penalties should not be part of somebody's criminal record. So, Robert, obviously you were in Boris Johnson's cabinet when it was decided that these rules should be put in place and indeed that people should be fined. Did this sort of libertarian in you, because I know you're a former lawyer, you've fought many miscarriages of justice over the years. Did you feel as uncomfortable as we believe the former Prime Minister felt about this very draconian approach? Because we then saw stories, didn't we, of women who were meeting on park benches and having a coffee. They were socially distanced and suddenly they were getting police fines and it just all seemed ridiculous. Yeah, absolutely. I think any anybody who is contemplating the biggest restriction in civil liberties in our history should doubt and question themselves about the wisdom of such a course of action. Uh, In the end, I think it was right that we did so. Uh, uh, The vast majority of people in our country did uh, obey the restrictions. There were 29,000 fines that were handed out. Some of them uh, were in error and there have been procedural questions and concerns about aspects of that. But the point that I'm making is that all I want to see is for us to stay true to what we said at the time, which is for them not to be used as a criminal record, for the police not to have entries on their database about these fines and penalties, and for people not to be stigmatised. I'm 
not saying that we should pardon everybody and you know forget it ever happened and that uh, Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak should be pardoned. That's a complete caricature of what I've said. Uh, and the leader of the opposition should hang his head in shame if he has deliberately chosen to misrepresent what I said. So, Robert, do you think that the the way that people were charged and what they were charged for in the in the sort of heat of the moment and in the 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 pandemic itself, uh, rushed legislation is often bad legislation. Do you think the right decision was taken about how many things became um, criminal offences? Look, this was a really difficult, fast-moving tableau. If you remember, we had changes to rules quite regularly. Sometimes before the ink was even dry, the rules were being changed. And the rule of law does need certainty. And I think a lot of us, me included, were, were worried and perturbed that at times we were we were really rushing uh, at, at such a pace that things were unclear. And I think lack of clarity is the worst thing you can do when it comes to the law and its enforcement. I think uh, looking back, we were left with very little alternative at the time uh, in order to deal with this. There isn't, I think, a framework within which uh, future governments can operate in, in an emergency way. And my view is that we need to have a root and branch reform of that so that uh, uh, any uh, criminal sanction being brought in is given the scrutiny that, frankly, I think it deserves. I think we were right to hold back from going full-throatedly down the road of, you know, full conviction for infringement. The fixed penalty notice uh, regime is one that we're all familiar with from parking uh, fines, etc. It was the right course of action to take. But there were, of course, a number of people who appealed those notices, ended up in the magistrate's court uh, and then got bigger fines. You know, I want to make sure that we are true to what we said at the time and that people uh, aren't being stigmatised or held back from employment because uh, these um, penalties and um, uh, infringements have entered the cr their criminal record. I think that's wrong and we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. It's the very nice, is... Sir Robert, to get your uh, clock there telling yeah, the us bell the is time, tolling. which is beautiful. As former Justice Secretary and a lawyer, do you think that the way polls are published during an election campaign should actually change? Should there, should, should there be policy change? Uh, in many countries, there are far stricter controls on how polls are published, particularly as you get closer to election day. Do you think that we yeah. should be considering that here in the UK? Definitely, yes. And I've had this raised by uh, residents. People have come to me and asked questions about what the basis of the polls is. There's no transparency about that. Uh, there's no consistency. Uh, whilst I think polls are an important part of the process, and I you know, welcome uh, that part of the debate. Uh, I don't think at the moment we've got the balance right. And I do think we need to look at uh, other examples internationally to see how we can get the balance right. So at the moment, this has just been uh, an election about polls and actually not about policy, which is why uh, Keir Starmer and the Labour Party seem to be getting away with offering a blank page to the British public. Kamal, it's interesting to see what the readers think of this. A poll on the Telegraph website reveals that 79% of over 8,000 readers think COVID rule-baking convictions should be wiped clean. Alistair Roy, um, he made the point that I questioned Sir Robert on. Bad laws thought up in haste without sufficient information, he says about the COVID uh, convictions. Emergency powers granted to themselves, the government, to prevent anyone or the law enforcement authorities to prevent anyone from challenging what was obviously an overreach. And they persevered far longer than necessary, wrecked a whole generation with their thoughtlessness and their profligacy and will damage future generations enormously. Simon Levy, however, says, I disagree with Robert Buckland. He says there are many minor convictions or infringements that should be revoked, but those who flagrantly ignored the rules don't deserve to have their slates wiped clean, he says. The vast majority of us followed all the rules that for many meant true hardship. We deserve to be respected for that and not treated like suckers. Camilla, let's move on to slightly less controversial territory. We don't treat anyone like suckers on this uh, podcast, do Indeed we? Not. Football. Scotland are playing tonight. They need to win against Switzerland and England are playing tomorrow against Denmark. And let's hope they play a bit better than we did against Serbia. Yeah. I think a we can say win. we, can't we? A win's a win. A win's a win, a win don't they say, in the boot room. Um, shall we get the latest from Tom Gibbs, who is our resident Daily T Euro specialist. He's also the Telegraph's senior sports writer. And here he is from Germany. 
Guten Tag, here I am in Cologne in front of the world's third tallest cathedral. There it is. Lots of Scotland fans around with the Tartan army here in full voice ahead of their game against Switzerland this evening. They're hoping for a massively improved performance after their first game against Germany where they were somewhat humbled by the hosts, unfortunately. They're also hoping they can get home at a reasonable time. There's always chat before a tournament like this or before an Olympics about whether the host city or the host nation is really equipped to deal with the numbers of people and, and the infrastructure challenges that await. You would have thought Germany is a pretty safe bet for something like the European Championships, but they've really made a meal of a lot of the organisational issues uh, so far, uh, especially getting out of stadiums. Uh, England fans had a really difficult time in Gelsenkirchen on Sunday night. It was very, very difficult to get out of their ground after the game against Serbia uh, and a very hard town to leave, not because it's particularly lovely, because you just can't fundamentally uh, get in enough trains. Uh, lovely to see a friend uh, behind me there uh, enjoying his day out in Cologne. Um, Gelsenkirchen is home to Schalke, who are one of the biggest teams in Germany, um, but usually the crowds coming in there are locals. Of course, when England come, uh, there aren't many places to stay in Gelsenkirchen, so all the fans had to head off to nearby towns like Essen and Dusseldorf, uh, and many were absolutely stranded. People were walking down the dark dual carriageway, uh, and uh, lots of overcrowding, issues with the trams, Pretty grim stuff. The biggest problem of all though here in Germany is the trains. I've been on a dozen or so so far since arriving. Not one has left the station on time. German train efficiency is a huge myth. Uh, the train I was on today from Dusseldorf here to Cologne did manage to pull out of Dusseldorf on time, but then it got stuck outside Leverkusen for an hour. Uh, I was talking to some Scotland fans uh, just as I arrived here who were uh, supposed to be on an overnight train out of Frankfurt. Uh, but, but it got cancelled, so they just had to stay there. Uh, they, they made the best of it. I'm not completely sure they'd been to bed, but no harm done. They seemed in good spirits. Game doesn't kick off till nine. Good luck, lads. Uh, you'd be over-egging it to say that this is ruining the tournament for anyone, but it's certainly harshing the buzz a little bit. And unfortunately, England are going to go be to back <laughs> to Gosenkirchen uh, on, uh, for the round of 16 game if they win their group. They'll go a long way towards winning their group if they can beat Denmark on Thursday night. They should have enough to beat Denmark. We said that against Serbia and uh, they made rather hard work of that in the end. Um, I fear a draw actually for England against Denmark, but please don't panic. Just getting out of the group is the only aim. Getting a train home afterwards would be a lovely bonus. Speaking of the German, it's a glorious smorgasbord of news, Kamal. I think Schmorgesborg is possibly Swedish, but yes, it's, it's it? certainly glorious and a very, very good mix of things. It sounds German, are you sure? It does sound German, doesn't we'll it? We'll be back with another Schmorgesborg, <laughs> we'll be back with another Schmorgesborg, wherever it may come from, tomorrow at five.